it's a, another stage. Oh, okay. Yeah. But where's the commission located? Located in Yandro. And then so you have to travel. Yeah, I have like several uh, nearly 200 miles. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this session that uh, uh, we are organized. That, uh, uh, we have here Mr. David K, is the special rapporteur on the right of expression and opinion from the nation that uh, he will uh, moderate this session. And then we have uh, Mr. Nyan Sao, Commissioner from Myanmar National Human Commission. And we should uh, have Mr. Mark Titus from Chief of Information and Communication Division from the Commission of Industry. I hope he will come soon to join us here. And also Mr. Nilanta Ilang Gamwa, Communication Officer from Asian Human Rights Commission. If, uh, if those people are already have this come to this uh, session. And uh, myself, Mimin Duartono, I'm the investigator, investigator officer in the Indonesia Human Commission who organized this event. So I think I give the word to the Okay. Thank you, Mimin. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming here. So um, I think this will be a really important opportunity, uh, you know, given the fact that RightsCon uh, was uh, was organized here in, in Manila and elsewhere uh, and being held here in the region. Uh, this is a real opportunity, I think, for us to talk uh, in concrete terms about what it means to um, to build an infrastructure of freedom of expression and freedom of opinion within the region, what it means to collaborate across countries in the region, uh, and what are the needs, what are the, the really important focal points where people are fighting for freedom of opinion, freedom of expression in the region today. Um, so, uh, so we're very lucky, as Mimi was describing just now, to have, um, to have uh, really representatives from Indonesia and Myanmar uh, two countries who, uh, w where we, we see a focus on freedom of expression in very different ways, um, but we also see institution building in very interesting and new ways. So what I thought we would do is uh, our panelists will each speak for um, up to 10 minutes, not more than that, about the institutions that they come from to describe a little bit uh, what the infrastructure for human rights is like in their countries. Uh, and then after that, we'll talk more specifically about some of the challenges that they face, both online and offline, and very quickly open it up so that we can have a conversation with everybody in the room about your own experiences in the region, your experiences outside the region, um, whether there are places that we might model the building of infrastructure, you know, looking at places like the inter-American system, uh, and really trying to figure out if there are models there that might be appropriate to build on uh, in Southeast Asia as well. So why don't I turn it over to, um, to Nyan Zha first, who will talk about the experience from the perspective of Myanmar's National Human Rights Institution. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jordan Nyan Zha, uh, Commissioner from the Myanmar Institution of Human Rights Commission. Uh, firstly, I would like to tell you about the establishment of Myanmar Nation and Human Rights Commission. It is a very, very new commission in the region. Uh, we are established in uh, uh, 2011 with the presidential degree, and then uh, uh, we constitute uh, with uh, 11 members in uh, 2014 to protect and uh, safeguarding of the fundamental fundamental rights of the citizen and string in the constitution of the Republic of the Union of Myanmar. Uh, then uh, we will do the role of NHRM to protect the opinion of and expression in the digital age. According to the article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, everyone, everyone has rights to enjoy freedom of opinion and expressions. Uh, there is also a provision in, in the constitution of our uh, 
Republic of the Union of Myanmar, Section 354, that uh, every citizen shall be at liberty in the exercise of the following rights, if not contrary to the laws and acted for union security, prevalence of law and order, community peace and tranquility, or public order and morality. Uh, to express and publish freely their convictions and opinions. Uh, further, Section 22A of the Mission and Human Rights Commission law also includes promote, promoting public awareness of human rights and efforts of, to combat all forms of discrimination through the provision of information and education. Uh, I would like to tell about the Internet Service in uh, Myanmar. Uh, it has been available since 2000, and internet censorship is present through software technology, but it's, it's being reduced year by year up to now. The situation of Myanmar telecommunication services that 1% of the populations are using fixed telephone, and 45.42% of population are using now mobile devices. And then only 10% 10 are using the internet. Uh, now, Myanmar people can access to the internet through their computers, mobile phone, and through the internet cafes. However, internet connection is not fast. It is sometimes unreliable, and the internet is not accessible through, through all of Myanmar. The first internet service provider is state. Uh, that was Pagan Cybernet uh, and um, Later become a uh, Myanmar Teleport, Yernabon Teleport, and Information Technology Service. And later, it's include Red Link Communication and Myanmar Post and Telecommunication. Uh, there's also a satellite internet connection is also available from the SkyMed satellite uh, television. Uh, now, uh, in uh, 2013, the Telenor Group of Norway and Oricu from Qatar were granted permission to provide mobile and internet services. The Myanmar Nation and Human Rights Commission has accessed the internet since 2004 and created a website in 2013 to support its role to promote and protect the human rights. The Commission uploads its statements, events, and reports to that website. And, uh, and the Commission has handled the complaints since 4th October 2011, but has not received any complaints to the issue of freedom of expression and privacy in internet, cybercrime, or hacking to violate the right of privacy. There's a law related to that in the next hour, com computer science development law and wide area network order and electronic transaction law. It's uh, adopted in 2004, covers any act detrimented to receiving or sending and distributing any information related to state security, law and order, community peace and tranquility, national solidarity, national economy, and national culture. Currently in Myanmar, there is free of expression and opinion in social media such as Facebook. However, in 2008 to 2019, reporters, bloggers, a photographer, and a former military officer were arrested for posting cartoons, leaking information and photographs, illegally using electronic media, and violation of electronic transactions law, and sentenced to long-term prison. In January 2012, some of them were released as part of a mass presidential burden for political prisoners. Uh, a deputy chairperson from Myanmar Nation and Human Rights Commission was participated as a member of the Political Prisoner Scrutinizing Committee and examining the cases of political prisoners, including those who were punished by the electronic transaction law and listed them for the presidential order. The Myanmar Nation and Human Rights Commission searches online for news on violations of human rights 
considers the issue and sends an investigation team to the area to prevent repeated or continuation of human rights offenses. We have moved into the digital age and the commission is aware of the optional for human rights violations in areas such as freedom of expression and opinion, data protection, privacy and freedom of associations through social media, mobile communication and digital networks. The commission is also aware of the need to do further research into the role of NHRS in protecting these human rights. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Maybe before we go to Mimi, can I ask you a couple of questions just so that we, everyone in the room understands what the um, National Human Rights Commission, uh, uh, what your power is in Myanmar. And I guess one question I have before we move to, to talk about the Indonesian experience is um, what, what is the power of the commission when you receive a complaint? Um, what is your ability to provide a remedy if you find a violation of any particular norm, whether it's freedom of expression or another particular uh, human right that might be violated? <laughs> When we receive uh, complaints from any fields, any issues, uh, we we examine it with with with, uh, with a group of commissions, not not by, uh, individually, and then we recommend it, and then uh, advise, and then send to the concerned uh, ministries or corporations or individuals, and then uh, we we are waiting for about thirty days. And we look for the response to from the uh, respondents, mm -hmm. and then uh, we we usually may to to go to the civil court or something, mm -hmm. yeah. And then some some of them uh, uh, take it, uh, they compensate or uh, something they they get remedy. We call both parties uh, to our commissions, and then we mediate it. Both, both of them, and uh, they, they, they were close to cases. And have you found, uh, first of all, congratulations on, on creating an institution, and it's a very young institution, so you deserve quite a bit of congratulations for, for building it, and I imagine you're still at, at some level in a building phase. Do you feel that you have cooperation from the government, and from government agencies? Um, yeah, largely, or do you find that you're you're often fighting against um, different forces in the country now? Uh, I would like to mention that uh, we have, uh, when we going out for the investigations, uh, we can call the witnesses from the uh, military departments, uh, some of the military officers come to give uh, some statements to to our commissions and also in police forces, and then. Uh, uh, the uh, government authorities also they, they respect to, to our conscience. Well, thank you, Nianza. So, Mimi, shall we turn to uh, to Indonesia? <coughs> and thanks for organizing uh, our session. Thank you, uh, David, for time. So, first, uh, I want to thank you to everybody who come to this session. It is very competitive session. <laughs> This coming year, yeah, I really appreciate. Uh, so the first one, I would like to uh, give very fundamental or basic thing about why the freedom of opinion expression is very important because it is uh, among the important rights that should be protected by the state because by uh, protecting and fulfilling uh, this right, people can achieve. Uh, uh, under basic right. So, <clears throat> and uh, in Indonesia itself, uh, we have around 250 million people. And uh, the people who has access to internet now is around uh, 90 million people. So it's very huge uh, market and also very huge uh, user. And Internet now is become very popular in the to uh, to change uh, uh, people view and also 
to uh, attract uh, kind of public policy and also to uh, change uh, particular policy which uh, not favor to the people. So it's not becoming become very popular. Uh, however, it is uh, the fact the fact so that uh, people just said over the person who expressing their view in internet is now is has been increased uh, year by year. So there are more and more people being criminalized because of they posting something, uh, posting their status in the Facebook or Twitter. And uh, said as obligation to respect uh, freedom of opinion and expression to ensuring that people has uh, freedom to express their opinion and express ex expression. And it is uh, in line with the Article 19, Paragraph 1 of International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, which uh, underline that. Uh, are from opinion are protected. So, therefore, harassment, intimidation, or stigmatization of a person, including arrest, detention, trial, or imprisonment of person of the opinion is, is prohibited according to the Article 19 of the Quran of ICCPR. And uh, we are from National Human Commission, which is an uh, independent state body. Uh, we have uh, important role and also function in this in this uh, context because we, in in the we have uh, we have uh, authority and power to to you know to uh, to uh, ensure that government will protect fulfill and also to respect the human right, especially its right to opinion and right of expression. And furthermore, in 2005, the, there was a UN resolution on promotion, protection, and enjoyment of human rights to internet, which underlined that online, online expression are protected as well as the offline expression. So the resolution of like, of, of brief, uh, state not to use its authority to suppress the freedom of expression, opinion, and and in getting the public information. Uh, this resolution is quite new and uh, we think that it needs uh, more time to in order this resolution is uh, okay so next is I would like to uh, show about the criminalization of the right of opinion and expression in the second time. So we have uh, information and electronic transaction in year 2008. So this law is really controversial one because many people has been criminalized uh, due to violate this uh, law. So for example, uh, within period 2008 to 2014. Uh, there is in 2008, uh, there is uh, only 3% of, uh, of the people who, who, uh, who have been legally prosecuted because of the consider violating this law. In 2009, 3%, and up to 2013, there was uh, 27% people who uh, legal prosecuted because of and 2014 then, then there was uh, 72 cases uh, the cases and then the, the cases was uh, uh, occurred in many places in Indonesia like in we have many region and it happened in from Aceh in the west part of Indonesia in Makassar, in Jakarta, and many places in Indonesia. So the problem on this law, among other, there are many, many uh, problems in this law, but I want to uh, take like 
only one, which is the article 27, paragraph 3 of information and uh, electronic information law, which said that anyone who distributes and or transmit and or make an electronic file or information accessible, it means contain of information and or remuneration can be jailed for maximum six years and or fine for maximum one billion rupiah. This is the 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 article which used by the uh, government and the, by people who who uh, think that uh, their reputation has been has been uh, uh, has been uh, has, 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 has been uh, deserved by it. For example, this is the somebody who, who posting something in Twitter has been recorded and also the another one is the lady in in New York province in Jakarta. He she also post something in her pad and because of that she is now also uh, arrested and uh, no no and is still uh, in the call. So it is the picture that saw the those uh, people who uh, who came to the court because of their uh, because of their opinion or expression in the Facebook and also in uh, Twitter and web. So it's just a little bit. So I, I now turn to the what is the role of human rights commission. So uh, in Indonesia we have uh, we have uh, authority to uh, give uh, amicus curia. So it's it's kind of uh, we can give opinion to to specific case that there is a human rights violation. So if the people asking uh, commission to present and then the judge will uh, agree we can we can uh, present in the court and we can give our opinion it is different with the expert side it's not we are not uh, uh, using this uh, using this uh, authority especially to uh, in case of the violation of right to opinion and right to listen and the second one is investigating human rights violation uh, as I said, that the number of uh, cases uh, that regarding with the uh, releasing of uh, uh, ICCPR or right to opinion has been increased. So we are now also conducting investigation. And the other one is monitoring human rights situation in the in Indonesia, particularly in publishing. Periodic, periodic report. We uh, receiving complaint uh, every year. We uh, receiving about seven thousand complaint from Indonesia, and some are related with the violation of right of opinion, right of expression. And we also publish recommendation to push remedy and prevent further violation. And uh, this is the most strategic, uh, most urgent agenda is to revise the law on information and advertising because this is the one who uh, the one in which uh, cause people has been criminalized because of their expression, because of their opinion. And then we are going to campaign human rights freedom on the internet. We have to harmonize the law to comply with human rights norm and standard. We also really need alien, alien dealing with civil society group. And we are now advocacy to monitor the role and function of the, 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 the new established national cyber agency. It is not yet uh, established, but the government is, has planned to set up the national cyber agency, which is uh, could be uh, the new what's it the more problem for our freedom 
on opinion and expression. So our proposal from the from the human rights commission in the region is uh, we need to consolidate among human rights commission because we have a uh, similar problem actually in the region. Uh, we need to strengthen our and networking among us, uh, and then we need also uh, then our workshop on right of opinion and expression, and we need planning on monitoring the right of opinion and expression, and maybe we need also kind of doing project to measure the implementation of principle of the right of opinion and protect the public policy sector. I think that's uh, from our perspective. Uh, thank you for uh, your time. Great. Great. Um, maybe before we move, and I want to get quickly to questions and to talk about some of the ways that we might think about building uh, the kind of uh, or following the action plan in the way that you described mm -hmm. here. You mentioned that there are thousands of complaints to yeah. the to the um, NHRI to the National Human Rights. Commission in Indonesia every year. Can you talk a little bit about how you respond to, to all of them and whether um, whether you're even able to, whether you have the capacity to respond uh, to all the complaints that you receive? Thank you. Uh, David, uh, actually, it is a very uh, overwhelming complaint because uh, uh, we have very uh, few staff. So uh, our commission, we have uh, maybe just for a background, we have four main functions. The first one is we can do medi mediation. The second one is uh, educating people, and then the research and study, and then the last one is uh, monitoring and investigation. So we have a uh, few. Uh, the way that uh, we uh, handling the complaint is uh, not. All complaints are uh, respond directly, but uh, we we will uh, we did filtering which one is uh, as contained human violation, which one is not. Those complaints which are not uh, contained of human violation, we will uh, we will send it back to the complainer. But those uh, those complaints that uh, we 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 think that it is about the human violation we will we will come we will uh, we will uh, examine further so we can uh, make a letter of clarification to those uh, people and then we can also uh, do uh, field monitoring if we think that the case is quite serious we can do uh, uh, monitoring to the directly to the field and then meeting with the uh, government, meeting with the victim, meeting with the perpetrator, something like that. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's the way that uh, we we handling the, the complaint. So, um, so I want to open it up to, to questions, and I think there, there are people in the room from the region and from other institutions, so why don't we just go to it directly. And, and, and as we're asking questions, first of all, be open, don't be you know, uh, directed by what I'm about to say, but I think what, what would be useful over the next 40 minutes or so is to try to uh, get a bit of an understanding of what the needs are in the region, what, what the ways might be that that we could imagine building a kind of regional infrastructure for human rights institutions that connect to one another across the region. Um, because as we look across regions, we see several that lack any infrastructure. There's some infrastructure in Southeast Asia. And I think a big question is how can we build upon what's already here? So there was a hand first in the back up there. Um, we have a second uh, mic, let's just. Good afternoon, my name is Gayatri from the Southeast Asian Defense Alliance. So I have two questions. Um, one for them from uh, Myanmar. How much are you proactive in looking at violations and then initiating your own um, 
whether it's investigations or monitoring, or do you wait for complaints to come? That's number one. Second one is, you know, I think if you look at freedom of expression, um, I think there's a lot of violations that are happening, and how much of um, the incidents that are related to media, to uh, online expression that you have received or you have initiated to do. I think it's very serious, particularly because the government has introduced a media law, but I think it's violating its own media law. That's my opinion. Um, second one is uh, for our friend from Indonesia, you talk about the regional plan. Um, you know, given the fact that the ASEAN Declaration on Human Rights is very, very <coughs> Disappointing, it's substandard when it comes to protections of freedom of expression. It is lower than the UDHR. So, um, how do you propose to go about creating this regional um, exchange? Um, I think that even that low standard is also not being achieved by the governments in the region. But would you actually look at wanting to revise the the uh, the A yeah ASEAN Declaration of Human Rights? Article 23, would that be one of your recommendations to initiate this regional action? Uh, first, first question is who activities you, you mean? Uh, you know, uh, in Myanmar, one, one of the journalists was killed uh, in, in an area, in a conflict area, and another uh, woman uh, was killed in the con contest in the uh, copper man area, you know, uh, that issue we we have no complaints to our commissions, and we we, we form a investigation team and go out and in, investigate the both of the cases. Okay. The second one is the uh, electronic transaction law. You mean media law? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> even that media law. Where we have no complaints on that uh, uh, issue. Uh, uh, most of our functioners think that is going to according to the law and order. I think. Yeah. Uh, we are thinking that uh, uh, some uh, journalists are uh, sentenced uh, in prisons. Uh, and uh, some uh, released by the presidential program. Uh, uh, we are out, like uh, in my presentation, uh, our deputy uh, chairperson was uh, participating in the political prisoners scrutinizing committee, and he is trying to, to take up this, this issue uh, and as a political prisoners and then make uh, some efforts to to have a presidential budget. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So my the question that uh this to me is about the regional action plan. So I agree that the human rights regulation the should is uh ASEAN human rights regulation is uh very weak yeah but uh I think it is uh, better uh, because uh, it is it that we started from 1990 uh, after the Vienna that uh, that the uh, Asian government tried to have a kind of uh, human rights liberation and finally it uh, it was uh, adopted and. And yeah, it, uh, and uh, about the the Asian Intergovernmental Human Rights Commission, it is also uh, not perfect, uh, of course, because it is a lack of uh, protection mandate. It, it is more uh, for the promotion mandate. Uh, but uh, as I said before, that. Uh, uh, the 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 road that uh, come up with this commission and also the gazette is not I think it's not uh, not easy uh, because of the Asian values which uh, which become the uh, obstacle for the 
I send a document to agree to the common lemongrass standard, something like that. But finally, uh, the human equation for us for ASEAN is uh, adopted. Text of Article 23, which is on freedom of expression, it is not stock and barrel taken from UDHR Article 19, except it does not include that the rights and, and the freedoms cover uh, across frontiers. You know, it's removed from the uh, from that provision on freedom of expression. Now, I think, but we are looking at issues that are transboundary. You know, the internet is an open space. Now, the the ASEAN Declaration deliberately removes that part. I don't understand why, and I don't know which governments are the ones that pushed for it. If at all, they were conscious of the implication. I suspect it's an issue of sovereignty, that you still want to control the internet uh, as a sovereign issue. So that, that's why I'm, I'm raising the question of what is the strategy in terms of the you know. So I think that, that point is very important, especially also for the human rights institutions within the country, not just for IHR, because you have this different point. So I just want to draw to the point that when it comes to the internet, Actually, the UDHR basically wants, uh, sorry, the ASEAN Declaration wants to retain sovereignty in terms of the internet. Okay, thank you. Uh, frankly, I did not uh, really, uh, really follow this uh, this issue, but because but since this discussion, so I also invite. I think my colleague is very, <laughs> you know, very well about that. So maybe you can share because frankly I don't uh, really understand about that issue. Uh, yeah, please if you if you. Uh, well, yeah. I think uh, I've been seeing uh, some of the breakthrough from the National Human Commissions, but they're working within the jurisdiction of national. So. As you know, ITR doesn't have a lot of, they cannot do many things because of the mandate. But some of the work of the Human Rights Commission has been beyond beyond that, that uh, National Human Rights uh, Commission of Thailand dealing with the issue in Myanmar and in Cambodia. So I, actually I was, uh, I was thinking of how the National Commission can identify some of the companies uh, from one country uh, operating in the other soil, and how uh, national commission can respond to uh, some of the issues happening in different soil. Because I think we are in the stage of going, uh, moving away <laughs> from ITER because ITER really had to work uh, by itself, and now they are working on how to strengthen their protection mandates. But at the same time, we have to find uh, possible alternatives within the national commission, as well as the. This is not a. This is not an uh, official uh, institution like ASEAN Parliamentary for Human Rights. So they they manage to bring the national mandate to foreign soil. So that's I, I think very very good. Uh, I just want to like to give the example of the ASEAN Parliamentary for Human Rights, the Parliamentary Forum. Indonesia and Philippines and Malaysia, they said uh, when they visited Laos asking for some but, uh, cases, what they said to the, the, to the government of Laos, my stakeholders in my country ask where is Sumba. So that is why I would like to find answers and um, answerable to my stakeholders. So again, this is uh, how this uh, two institution using the national mandate to go beyond uh, national jurisdiction. My stakeholders in my country ask where is Songba? So, uh, uh, is a development actors working on the development issues in Laos who were. Missing? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. I thought everyone knows what's up because it's very famous. Um, so again, this is one of the example of how 
national uh, organization <coughs> with national jurisdiction can go beyond uh, their national. But uh, I don't want to make any comments on, on iTunes. <laughs> My name is Mia Nabueva. I'm from the Child Rights Coalition Asia. And the reason I want to speak is because uh, if you look at the numbers of people who are in the internet, I think you'll notice that a lot of them are actually youth and children. And that's why it's very important to make sure that we actually ensure the freedom to be heard, Article 12 of uh, UNCRC for children. And I think the human, I would really encourage the National Human Rights Commissions to take, in, take this into account. I know that the Philippine Human Rights Commission has a center for children's rights. And I hope that other human rights commissions will also take special interest on children. But for the special rapporteur, I want to flag this. It's, it's very important that we actually help to promote the right of children to be heard and to participate. And oftentimes, uh, it might come to the point that the children, when they talk about what concerns them, they might actually question the conditions that, in which the children live. And this is where I get, start to get worried. Because when children live in societies where there's very high incidence of violence, and the state has a responsibility to protect children from violence, and they ask, why is our society violent? I hope they will not be uh, put into question for questioning the, the state of national security, for example. Or when children want to express their personality and they're still going to the stage of trying to explore their sexuality, for example, and they voice their concerns about this, uh, I hope it doesn't become a question of public morality. So this is my concern. We have to make sure that we do promote that more children become active and they're already in the internet, but that we use it in a very pro productive and constructive way. And at the same time, I would like to remind that we have a responsibility to protect them from harmful content as well. So I hope that the special rapporteur will take this into account that you uh, <coughs> place a special uh, part in your report about the situation of children. Because I'm particularly working on promoting children's participation, especially in matters that affect them. But everything affects children. The quality of health services, the, the way prisons are run. I mean, just to say some of the key things, like when there's demolition of urban poor settlements, this all affects children. And children have a right to say something. But I think we have to make sure that children are not going to be penalized for speaking out. Thank you. Okay. If we could pass that sort of toward the back here, but yeah, this is, um, I'm not sure this is actually on. Yeah. Um, the thing I wanted to add in response to that, well, so first off, I think you raised several important points. Actually, my predecessor, Frank LaRue's final report was, was actually specifically on this question of the right of children to freedom of expression. And I think it's it's worth thinking about that and integrating it into to work at a regional and international level as well. But I wanted to turn it over to see if you had any comments in response to that question about the role and whether you think and integrate questions related to children, their access to information, access online and freedom of expression in any particular way. If you have a response to that. Yes, this one, I hope it would be uh... Uh, met with what your uh, expectation. So I think uh, for the children rights issue, I think something that uh, could be strength for the Asian government is I think all the Asian government has been ratified the CFC, right? CFC and CDAO. So uh, uh, different with ICPR with the IC CSCR, not all government uh, yet ratified, but for uh, CRC, all the Asian government has been ratified. I think that could be a uh, pushing factor, pushing factor how to uh, maybe get 
uh, to uh, to do advocacy for the digital right to reason in 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 term of the right to opinion and reason. I think that that thing that that be uh, good. Hello, my name is Camille uh, from Indonesia. First of all, I would like to say that I really respect your initiative for the significant two rights in Indonesia, our place in Zilek, and the lives of the government's own, also chairperson of um, the National Commission of Human Rights in Indonesia, and the forum we then speak about uh, freedom of expression, religion, and religion value. So, um, I really want to ask about uh, the implementation on national level in terms of internet governance. Because I think internet governance it will relate to government, uh, civil society, academic sector, and uh, corporates and others on um, the sector. So if there's a case about blocking or filtering, for example, how is your goal in this case? If society wants to bring the case to the court because right now there's a debate about the legal protection on the internet should be under the law that is has been exist or we should need to create new law cyber law and how is your role in this case if for example civil society won arbitrage process or do you have recommendations how to, to, to solve this kind of issue for Indonesia context or something? And the second is about child protection. Censorship and blocking is always under the name of child protection. But on the last of the government forum, there's a young people protesting saying that we actually don't want to use as a reason for blocking and filtering. We also want to have access about sexuality. How is it to be gay and lesbian? And um, so somehow I feel that um, how is it to be uh, you as a mediator between the government and the civil society in bridging this issue? And the last uh, issue happened is about surveillance. How Australia government um, actually um, spying the Asian government on the Asian and the civil society uh, communities in Indonesia. How do you work with um, international level of internet, uh, internet governance, for example, ICAN? I mean, yeah. So um, um, I would like to ask you about how you know the internet governance. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your question. So the first one is about uh, uh, legal protection for the internet user. So this. The thing that I mentioned before that uh, the problem is uh, the existing of the information and transaction threat, uh, the information law, which is uh, which is uh, not comply with the human rights standard. And I heard that uh, it is now ongoing that the government will revise this law, but. The revised document is much worse than this, than this one. Uh, that's why the 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 I think the ur urgent step on the strategic step is how to uh, influence the government and also with the parliament not to not to uh, process the the amendment of the law and. And oh, we urge to revise the law itself because it's not comply with the human right standard. And for us in the commission, uh, frankly, uh, I can say that this issue is not yet our priority uh, because of the number of complaints that concerning with this issue is very small. Maybe only yeah of. 7,000, maybe only about 100, something like that. So it's not uh, yet a big issue for our commission. Uh, but uh, but uh, I think that it, the commission should be start to taking this issue as an uh, important, uh, important uh, issue. 
That's why I'm organizing this uh, session is to yeah to start with uh, my sim idea is go to uh, invite the human rights commission in the region to to start to think about how we can collaborate how we can uh, uh, building network on this issue because sooner or later it will be our common is maybe in my mind it's not yet a big issue but maybe in the coming year it will be uh, very big because uh, it could be used by the government to suppress the civil rights and especially also I think we need to uh, with human commission and also with civil society we need to really uh, really monitor the 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 problem plan to establish the cyber national cyber agency i think this is very very important for us to how we can uh, set up a, a plan also how we can uh, influence the government uh, in order that the new agency will not uh, getting the human rights and human uh, words I think that's about the child protection, uh, yeah, I think uh, the thing that it is now still uh, challenge for Indonesia itself, including the Commission, is about the culture and the culture and also the relativity of human rights. So people still said that the that the that. Uh, some human rights values is not fit with the local culture so therefore uh, the child should be protected that uh, it is that we uh, trying to trying to you know to to convince people how to uh, in one set we uh, we respect the child right to be heard and protect factor child participation but in another sense we need also to uh, listen to what people say I think that's all about the surveillance uh, I don't know about this because uh, it's beyond my beyond my capacity as well but can I think as far as I know, because I'm in the investigation division, we don't have this compliance uh, concerning with the surveillance. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question here? For, yeah? Oh, you got mic. Great. I'm um, here now, but you will not ask for my team, I guess. Um, I would like to raise a question, uh, three questions to the Human Commissioner. The first one is um, over hundreds of uh, peaceful student protests were arrested in March, um, brutally uh, by the police. And how do you think of it? uh, its uh, violation to freedom of expression or not? This is the first question. And another, another two question is, uh, Ami Ryo, uh, he's a reporter and he's, uh, he was arrested and this is a photo and now he is free. Uh, even though he is free, uh, his Facebook and his phone are uh, controlled by the government. And now there's also the student protester, the leader of the student protester, his, their phone and their Facebook account are now chosen by the police. Uh, how do you think it's a violation to the right to privacy or not? And the three question is, uh, what is your human rights commission's plan to solve this problem? Thanks. Uh, about your question, so number one is uh, uh, the violations of the students and the protection in uh, Yangon and uh, Nara Lebanon, I think. I mean, uh, it is already uh, formed an uh, investigation team by, by the government uh, to investigate uh, the, the public violations, uh, who, if, uh, who is responsible for that actions, and they try to take 
uh, action uh, for that uh, responding to the fiber persons. And uh, another thing is that we uh, actually we don't know about the, uh, the blockage of the Facebook and the uh, and the phone of the reporter in the Indian sense. Yeah, we don't have any complaints on about that uh, issues. Yes, uh, there is no complaint. Uh, maybe there is no complaint uh, to Human Rights Commission, National Human Rights Commission, but I want to know your perspective and your point of view on these uh, cases. It's my uh, personal opinion. Uh, uh, your first question is that uh, it's a uh, violation. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's a violation to the freedom of expression. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Uh, number two is uh, uh, it may be a violation to the freedom of privacy. Yeah. Right, privacy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, there is no complaint. That's why we don't have any plan to solve this problem. Uh, I mean, to solve these uh, cases. Right. Uh, about about this uh, digital uh, digital issue, uh, this is a very new new issue for our commissions, and I'm I'm the only one trying to to understanding and uh, take uh, learn some lessons from, from this conference also. I guess I mean so I think what one of the things you're trying to get at, and one of the maybe a disconnect here is. Um, and I think there's variation across the region as to the authority that different national human rights institutions have uh, to act without having a basis for a complaint. And, and I guess maybe the question here is, um, in, the, in the context of the Myanmar human rights institution, you only act in relationship to or in reaction to a specific complaint that's, that's brought to you. Is that, that's right. So. Right, there's, I mean, there may be a question about expanding jurisdiction in some cases for human rights institutions as well, but uh, it may leave some institutions in a, in a situation where their particular opinion may be one thing, but they don't have the jurisdiction to do anything about it, which might be one of the big problems for some of them. Yeah, so we have a question here. Have you had any communication or dialogue with those companies about serving as a potential resource given the current lack of legislation on lawful interception or wiretapping? So this morning in our session, we heard many similar things about activists having their phones hacked or stolen and taken away. Do you see an opportunity for partnership with the mobile operators and FTC telling our world? Uh, like I, I already say that uh, we are not uh, uh, doing uh, no contact with the, the Hindu operators from Myanmar, like NBP, and also Oil and uh, uh, Yagima. And, <clears throat> and so uh, this is a very new issue for our commissions. And later on, we, we will try to, to handle on this issue also. Uh, because uh, in our commissions, you cannot decide uh, to, to take action in an issue. Uh, we have to, to compromise all, all our commissioners in the commissions and decide that this issue will be uh, uh, investigated, this, this issue will be communicated or, or not. Yeah, yeah it seems um, at the moment the operators have said have received some legitimate requests from the telecom regulator for information um, with missing persons case, human trafficking, drug cases. Um, but kind of given this morning, it seems that there might be an opportunity to have dialogue around that issue. I think the companies are interested in, in having a way to surface um, grievances from their customers or users. So just, just putting that out there 
uh, we are not uh, uh, doing to that issue yet. Let's go to the very back first. Good afternoon. My name is Alcon Bashatelan from the Director of the Internet Decision Project. Uh, two quick questions. The first one is that. Has there been, or is it planned, or does it exist, the equivalent in the ASEAN of the rapporteur for freedom of expression? Is this envisaged, or is this a way to evolve? Because this exists for the organization of American states, it exists for the OEC uh, in Europe, and so it would be interesting to see whether it can spread. The second, the second question is related to the comment on the uh, ASEAN declaration. I find it extremely interesting that the transborder dimension is being removed at the very same time when uh, a lot of countries have, are making as many efforts as possible to apply their own laws extraterritorially. So in a strange way, there is this uh, disconnect between the notion that uh, access should be restricted, but at the same time, the law that is very specific to the country should potentially apply to other um, uh, to actors who are outside of the country. How is this perceived in the uh, in, in, in the region, and is this a leverage that can help improve the situation? Highlighting the disconnect. Yeah. Those are two very good questions. Maybe I just start with the first one, and then Mimi, if you want to to address them, um, I. Th I think this is the problem that was first asked at the beginning, which is um, if you start to institutionalize something, what's the basis, what's the legal basis for the institutionalization? And if you do it on the basis of the ASEAN uh, Charter, Human Rights Charter, then you risk locking in a limited mandate and maybe a mandate that actually is uh, enforcing rules that we don't want to see enforced. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, I think one of the questions for the region really is to determine whether um, maybe it's civil society acting first on the basis of the Universal Declaration and the ICCPR and other, uh, other instruments of international law that touch on freedom of expression, like the, um, uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, whether that can be the basis for civil society stepping up first to create a kind of uh, regional forum for this kind of discussion that down the road may lead to something that then the states adopt. And, and you know, we've seen different kinds of, um, you know, institutionalized uh, forum develop for, you know, after the lead of civil society. And we've also seen them develop in places that you wouldn't have thought they might develop. And the inter-American system is, is a really good example where you saw the regionalization develop at a time when you wouldn't have thought it developed, and it's actually a very rich and important um, uh, source of international law and regional law today. So um, I think that should be on the table, a regional rapporteur. And, and you left out Africa as well. There's a rapporteur in the African system as well, and certainly this region deserves it. Whether it would be something that could be based on the existing regional framework is is another question that is, I think, very risky. But um, maybe, maybe you can talk a little bit about what that regional framework might look like and whether it might include a kind of a regional rapporteur. Thank you. Uh, I think that's a uh, good uh, point there. I think if we get to the history in the creation of the Regional Human Rights Commission in Southeast Asia, uh, there was a very strong collaboration uh, between the Human Rights Commission and the Civil Society Organization. At that time, there was a Indonesian Human Rights Commission and Philippines uh, among few who really advocate uh, that the creation of the regional Human Rights Commission in Indonesia is was necessary and. For my view, uh, that the creation of the Asian Human Rights Commission, also the IGR, was really tried by the GSO because I, uh, because I was involved in GSO before joining the Commonwealth. So 
I quite uh, knew that the GSO network in ASEAN is really uh, powerful. So, and uh, of course, the GSO need to work further uh, in the creation how to uh, how to uh, strengthening the 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 ASEAN and also maybe it is also need or maybe uh, Asian human rights court something like that because we have not we don't have yet the regional mechanism to address the human violation for example there is already in Europe in Africa and also in Latin America but we don't have yet in Asian maybe if uh, yeah if we, we uh, if the human commission and also TSO can work together convince that the human rights regulation is necessary, I think it would be possible to uh, to fill the gap that that uh, because of the high chair that's not uh, really protection and that could be could be uh, it could be the strategy. Great. I think we've actually come to the end of our time for this session. So. Um, First, I want to thank you all for, for coming to this session. I want to thank our panelists from Myanmar and Indonesia for sharing their experience. Um, I want to encourage you to go to the Ruby Room, I think, after this, uh, and, uh, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks for coming.